Good morning and welcome once again to Onward in Love and Caregiving. I needed to stop because we were having a technical issue on this end and I didn't, there was no way for me, at least in my simple understanding, to correct it. So I'm pleased to say we are back, we are up, we are live, and I'm thrilled to see you. I'm Greg Johnson. I'm the president and CEO of GJP International, which is Greg Johnson Partnerships International. And here in New York, I have the great privilege of serving as the chief advisor for family caregiving to the CEO of Emblem Health. And I welcome you to this ongoing program, this wonderful opportunity to come together, as has been our tradition now for several years, to talk about family caregiving, faith, and spirituality, taking a look at the very big picture that we all share, and also celebrating being united as a world in family caregiving. I want to just remind you that all of our programs are available on our YouTube channel. And the YouTube channel is entitled Family Caregiving with the Rev. And you can access all the programs that we have been doing along with many, many things that I have taped over the years for Emblem Health. And particularly, you will find there the original you are not alone, which I call Family Caregiving 101. It's eight items, it's eight pieces to the series, and each is about eight to ten minutes long. And each is a perfect entity in itself for a topic for an event. If you are talking about family caregiving, if you're working with someone on family caregiving, these are bite-sized pieces that help us understand what this word, what this concept, and what this gift that is the backbone to the world's health care systems. So I urge you, please share it. This is free. It's meant to be used. That's how we created all of this. And we want you to use it, whether you're using it for someone that you're caring for, or you're working with one person or a group of persons. Please share the caregiving. All right, I am so pleased that you are all with us today and that we are having the privilege of talking together. Now, as has become our tradition, when we begin the program, I always like to have a few moments during the pandemic to first of all, to give thanks. And that may be a strange place to start, but Thanksgiving is the place to start. To give thanks for the progress, to give thanks for those who are stepping up, for the frontline workers, for the first responders, and for the continuing passion of the healthcare industry. And to give thanks to God that through scientists, through people through his children, through our brothers and sisters, that vaccines have been found, that the lives are being saved. And so let us give thanks. And then let us also not forget all of the people who are being so crucial to the health and the care that is taking place right now. Let us pray together. We give thanks, O oh Father. We give thanks for the positive, wonderful steps that are occurring in the pandemic worldwide. We know there are many things that need yet to be done, and we pray for patience. We pray for wisdom, and we pray for guidance. We give thanks for the caregivers of the world that we have become. And today we particularly give thanks for grocery store clerks, for truck drivers, for medical professionals, for those in assisted living as caregivers, for restaurant workers, 
for small businesses, for warehouse workers. We give thanks for farmers, mail and delivery workers. We give thanks for first responders, and we give thanks for garbage collectors sanitation workers. We thank you for the police, for the correction offers, officers, for the firefighters. Oh, Father, we give thanks, and we pray blessings on each. We pray their safety as they give of their lives for so many others. O oh, Father, we pray for those who are being obstinate on the vaccinations. Lord, melt their hearts. And O oh, Lord, rid us of so much horrible theology. Bless us as we go forward, for we pray in all the holy names of God. Amen. Now this morning, I am going to be beginning a series that's going to, I think, take about three weeks, and that would be appropriate, because the next three weeks, we will be talking, using a quote from Ram Dass, walking each other home. Now, I think that's probably one of the best descriptions of what family caregivers do, and I think that it will be something that we can benefit from. So I'm going to invite you to mark it on your calendar. And then on the 29th of this month, our guest for October will be the Reverend Marion A. Gambardella. Marion is an interfaith minister. She has been a leader in the world of family caregiver, caregiving, a member of the Emblem Health New York City Partnership for Family Caregiving, Core, she's one of the board members and founders of that organization. And she is a healing therapist, she is a teacher, a lecturer, and in my case, a very dear friend and mentor. So I look forward to sharing, and I particularly look forward because she's also going to be sharing, beyond her work in family caregiving, she's going to be sharing with us a new project that she is doing with singers and with actors, and I look forward to sharing that with each and every one of you. So now, I want to begin our series. I have talked about this in past weeks. We want to do a program about walking each other home. Now, where did that come from? Well, it's a quote from Ram Dass, and many of you will recognize that quote. And it's probably the best definition of what we are doing here on Earth. And it is a phrase that came to have great personal meaning for me. When I had the privilege of walking Marie Thompson home, Marie was an incredible friend, someone very special in my life, a woman of great accomplishment, a woman of great passion, of great love and great caring. And she was a member of Prayer Circle over at the Marble Collegiate Church, where we really got to know one another extremely well. And one year when I came back from Bali, Marie came to me and she said, I'm going to Bali with you next year. And I said, well, that's wonderful. If you can sit that long, it's a long airplane ride. You're most welcome. Well, she did indeed. But there were challenges because health issues began in her life. And cancer began to appear. She took steps and she made the decision she was coming and she did come to Bali. And it was a special, special time. Several mornings, I invited her and Mary Jo to walk with me along the beach at the Indian Ocean. That's where my home is, and their hotel was just down a bit. And we walked together. And during that time, I invited them to join me, as is my tradition, to spend time giving thanks for the sunrise, for actually for the dawn and then the sunrise, which is always marvelous. It's one of those great parts about Bali because, of course, it's not like living in Manhattan. 
you can begin with the stars, the morning star, and then it gets very dark, and then comes the dawn, and then comes the sunrise. And we were talking of some very serious things. Marie had taken action so that her diagnosis would allow her to travel, but there were going to be decisions that she would need to be making upon returning home. And we prayed about that. And we also talked about this phrase from Ram Das, walking each other home. And as we walked along, one morning Marie looked at me and she said, Greg, will you walk me home? And I must admit, I teared up, as I still feel right now. But I was touched by it. And I said, Marie, of course I will, even before you asked me. But it's a two-way street. I want you to walk with me. Neither of us knows who will go first. Well, as it turns out, Marie did this past year. But during the time from that request in Bali until my last visit with her at Calvary Hospital, we were walking one another home. And I was blessed by the topics that we talked about. And Marie knew, because we, we jokingly talked of that, she said, you can't use this yet on a broadcast. But once you've used it for my memorial, then share it. So honoring that request, that's what I'm going to do in these next three weeks, because it's a very appropriate time of the year. It's October, and October ends with that hallowed eve. Now, I know you think of it, we all think of it as Halloween, but it is really the hallowed eve of All Saints Day and All Souls Day. And those are going to be the preparations that we're making. Now, one of the things we needed, and we began talking about this, none of us gets out of here alive. So one of the most important things for us to do in walking each other home, and it's not negative, it's real, life and death. It is when we face that that life becomes even more precious. For as we look at the finitude, the shortness, the time that is ours, we want to make that time count. But why? Because it's given greater urgency by the fact that we're only here for a short period of time. And so, theologically, there's a fancy word called eschatology. But that's looking at life from the end gives life meaning. And so it became very, very important for us to do that. We also looked at, and it was appropriate in Marie's life, Marie had spent over 40 years in the corrections department. She was responsible for receiving people into the corrections system. What did that mean? She was receiving people from a life of great difficulty and burden. She wasn't really interested in the details at first. She just wanted to welcome them, bring them into a new door as they closed the door on the past, but welcomed people to resurrection living. And so Marie and I began talking about that. I said, you know, Marie, as I look at it, death is a doorway, and those who are left behind are grieving. But as we walk through that door, we are greeted by all those who have gone before us, those who have gone on ahead, and we are blessed. So it's very much like many doors in our lives. As one piece closes, another opens. The body, it was useful here on earth, 
but the soul has gone on. And many of you who have been present at death know what I'm talking about. There is a moment when that spirit leaves the body. And as I like to say, this old Cadillac has fallen apart. It's not needed anymore. It has done its job. And the soul returns from where it came to rest, I believe, to review, and to gain new strength and opportunities. While we were walking, I also shared with them, with Mary, Joe, and Marie, this was the place that I had found the most comfort after Putra, our son of 20 years, died 16 years ago this past week, actually, so it's been on my heart as well. It was that place where I sat one morning, and I'd never seen it since, and I'd never seen it before. But it was a morning perhaps five years after Putra had died. And my heart that particular morning was filled with Putra. And I had tears. I had thanksgiving. For I was journeying from grief back to a life of love. I was dealing with surrender. I was dealing with gratitude. And God sent a gift to me that morning as I sat there doing my daily readings and prayer. Suddenly, out of the corner of my right eye, I saw a ship. It was still dark. It was that dark time before the dawn. And it was a ship, and all the lights were on the ship. It was absolutely gorgeous. They'd obviously had a great party the night before. And now it was leaving the harbor in Bali and heading on out into the east, into Nusa Tenggara. And it was a simple message, but it was so powerful. I couldn't help but think, Putra might be on that ship. Yes, on that ship, as a metaphor. And as I prayed, I watched the ship, and it kept going and going and going, and it finally disappeared over the horizon, beyond my human seeing. The ship was not gone. It was gone from my human sight. God knew where that ship was. Just as God knows at this moment where Putra is and where Joe is and every loved one in my life and yours. This, the human life, is not all that there is. And so we began discussing this aspect of death, seeing the life within it. We also looked in Bible references of Jesus saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. And we weren't necessarily calling in interior designers. We used those as metaphors. But we also were standing in one of the most beautiful places in the world, on the shore of the Indian Ocean in gorgeous Bali. And we couldn't help but say, a God who can create something so, so beautiful will be with us forever. And I can only imagine what that is going to be like. And then as we returned to New York, I suggested that Marie and I read together a book that had been published. It's the book called, you know how I love books, The Also Life, by my dear, dear friend, Reverend Barbara Cawthorn Craft. This is a very special book. Barbara wrote this. Often people talk about the afterlife. 
Barbara in this book suggests no. It's the also life, that much bigger life. And the definitive chapters, each of them are wonderful, but the definitive chapter comes at the end. It's entitled The Two Baskets, and I urge you to read it. I'm not going to do that entire chapter for you. It's something you need to read. The first time I heard it, Barbara used it as the homily for my late husband, Joe, at his memorial service. And it was the most powerful message I've ever heard. For in a metaphor, she talks about us, this world, this galaxy, being enclosed in a basket. And it's beautiful, it's wonderful, and we love it. And we love everyone who's in it. And yes, it's human, it's time, there are times before and after. But surrounding that, is yet a greater, enormous basket from which we came. We don't know it at the present. And throughout life, occasionally, we peek through. You know how the basket is woven. We peek through. We say, yeah, I wonder what that is. Looks familiar, but we don't pay attention to it because where we are is so beautiful. As life goes on, our individual baskets, you know, they start to fall apart. Disease, sickness. And as that basket ends, as it is no longer, we look around. Yes, this, this was home. And then we begin to see a place of no time, for time is a condition of simply this earthly being, not of time, space, matter, but of spirit, where the soul has come from. And we are in heaven because we are living in the presence of the divine. And that gives us a clue right here. I always like to say heaven is practicing the presence of the divine. And we're going to be talking more about that. But I urge you, the Also Life by Reverend Barbara Cawthorn Crafton. It will bless your life. I am certain of that. Now this morning, I'm going to conclude our program, the first in the series of Walking Each Other Home. Next week, I'm going to share with you some of the other things that we talked about, from very practical things to prayer, to documentations, the entire story, for I want to share it with you. It blessed my life. It taught me many things. And Marie and I would like you to be blessed by our journey. And one of the great gifts of that journey was scripture, and particularly the Psalms, certainly Psalm 23 but also Psalm 121. And it is that Psalm that I'm going to use to conclude our program this morning. I lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. 
he shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and forevermore. And it is so. Amen. God bless. I look forward to seeing you next week when we share together onward in love and caregiving. Until then, have a wonderful week. And I hope to see you at some of our other broadcasts on Sunday night, on Monday morning, and of course, hymns by request at 11 o'clock on Thursday. Until then, God bless. I'll see you real soon.